What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Right. You need money now? Then buy, buy, fix, and flip. If you need money later on, you just want to invest it, right? Like people that invest in RSPs, right? They don't see that money until they're 65 or, or older, right. right? So for those people that want to kind of like turtle their investment, then buying with cash flow is the way to go. Hey guys, welcome to the Lumi Wealth Podcast and video series where we talk about entrepreneurship and investing, basically how we can make you more money. In this episode, we talked to someone named Tony Ning. So he's a real estate agent that's been doing this for almost 30 years. Bought his first property was in high school, which is amazing, right? And we talk about student housing and why buying a student house is actually a great investment. It's really good cash on cash returns, meaning you generate a lot of income from this property. You get a lot of cash flow coming in as opposed to you buy a property and you have to put more into it. This is immediately producing cash for you. And then we also talk about buying a house with a basement in it where you can rent that out as well and you have two sources of income from one property. It's not one tenant that you're relying on. This is a fantastic thing if you want to generate some income and if you want to grow your real estate business and start making a lot more money. This is a fantastic listen. Check it out. Hi, Tony. Welcome to uh, the Lumi Wealth podcast and, and video show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. It's great. Pleasure. Uh, pleasure is all mine and our audience, obviously. Um, so do you want to tell our audience a little bit about who you are and kind of your background? Sure. Well, um, I've been in real estate as an investor and a broker for the last over, a little bit over 30 years now. And how I got into real estate is really, really interesting because uh, I was born extremely, extremely poor. Probably out of an audience of 150, I'd be in the top five of the poorest kids that grew up. Now, long story short, my mother was a single mom and she had four, four of us to raise and didn't make a lot of money. And her dream was to own a home. And all my life, all I heard was, you know, if I could just own a home, that would be a big dream come true. So. At 14, I uh, went to Cole's bookstore and I bumped into this book called Think and Grow Rich. I read it from cover to cover, read it every day. Okay. And it really, it really changed my life, seriously. And uh, so I started working when I was 15 years old. By the time I was 18, between working weekends and summers, I managed to save up about $5,000. And my mom did as well. So we had about $10,000 all together. We saw a house for $50,000. We really wanted to get into it. My mom was really nervous. And uh, we put an offer in anyways because of my thinking grow rich. Uh, you know, nothing's right. nothing's impossible. Pigs can fly, kind of kind of a concept. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's 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 the, that's mm -hmm. actually my stepmother coming up. If pigs can fly, and uh, my, pigs <laughs> fly. my pigs were flying all over the place. But anyways, yeah, it's, it's a new book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it will be for sure. Yeah. Uh, so so we put an offer in. I went to the bank, and the bank says no. Uh, you're in school. I was still in high school, as a matter of fact. You're in school. We can't give Impressive you a mortgage. buying a house in high school. That's great. Yeah, unless you quit your job, right? And uh, my mom didn't qualify. So between the two of us, we couldn't get the mortgage. So I went to the seller and said, seller, you know, we, we got turned down. How, how can we make this work? We really want the house, right? Is there anything I can do to make it work? I mean, I'll, I'll give you full price, right? And if you're willing to take back a mortgage or hold, hold the mortgage in place of the bank, you know, I'll give you the best possible rate that we can afford. Anyways, long story short, they took the full price, and uh, while the prevailing rates were around six or seven percent at it, at that time, we settled an eleven percent mortgage, which was a lot, yeah. you know. But for us, hey, you know, we just wanted to get in, right? And my right. mom was really worried about, you know, how are we going to pay for this? How we, you know, I said, don't don't worry, I'm I'm going to work, I'm going to continue to work uh, weekends and and summers, and uh, you know what? Worst comes to worst, we'll rent some of the rooms out upstairs. Yeah. And we did that for the first couple of years. It helped pay, you know, pay down our mortgage. Our mortgage, believe it or not, was two hundred eighty bucks, and we were sweating buckets. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wish that was the case today, right? Yeah, I know, I know. But one day, some <laughs> one day, somebody's gonna look back and say, you know what? Rent was only twenty five hundred dollars a month, yeah. right? Look, you know, paying like ten thousand dollars a month right now. So I yeah, don't know what you're sure. just gonna bring. But uh, that's that's what got me excited about real estate. And I said, wow, if if pigs can fly, I have made one fly. I'm gonna continue to do this, right? So, right. and so I, I spent the last uh, 30 some odd years uh, in real estate, buying and selling and buying and holding. And also uh, as a real estate broker agent, helping other people with their investment properties as well. As well. So, 
That's great. Yeah. So you really you really have a lot of experience then. You started yeah. in high school. I don't think there's a lot of people that could say they bought their first house in high school. You know, we had no choice. We, you know, I mean, it was that or, you know, it, trying to rent a place was very difficult back in those days, you know, and then we didn't have the landlord and tenant uh, um, act the way we have now. I mean, back in those days, the landlord says, get out, you get out, you just pack your bags and go. You don't have a choice. You know, now you can go to the landlord's tribunal, which is which is nice for the tenants. But, you know, it, I think they went a little bit too far to to the tenant side and not not make it uh, as, uh, you know, as uh, amicable for everybody. And, in, in, you know, that's that's uh, in, in concern, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, maybe they went a little too far. So, yeah. yeah so you've been doing this for uh, for 30 years now. So yeah. do you want to tell us about some of maybe your favorite deals that you've worked on or sure. some deals that you worked on now? Sure. Yeah. Well, let, let, let's start with uh, the investor. I mean, you, you, you know, a lot of listeners and viewers are, are looking to get their first investment property or maybe even yeah. a seasoned investor. Uh, I think I think that the, the one thing that I learned uh, that's really important is to know what your know what your exit strategy is. Are you buying to sell or are you buying to hold on to it? Right. It makes a, a world of difference. Right. And if you're looking to buy and hold on to it, you have to look at the cash flow. You have to look at the rental income. And your rental income should ex- exceed all your expenses. If it doesn't have a positive cash flow, I highly discourage you to get into it, unless there's some other upsides to it. But in general, I would say if it doesn't have a positive cash flow, don't buy it to hold on to, right? And and why do you say that? Because because the, the, the negative cash flow is going to come back and haunt you. You can't buy more than so many properties. I mean, let's say we all make so much money per month working at a job or in a business. So if the negative cash flow will eat away at your income. Right. So let's say one property, you're minus five hundred dollars. Your second property, you're minus one thousand dollars. Your third property, you're minus fifteen hundred dollars. Your fourth property and so on. At some point, you're going to have to stop because you just don't make enough money. Right. Whereas if you, if you have a positive cash flow, you have plus five hundred, plus one thousand, plus fifteen hundred, plus two thousand. When do you want to stop? You don't have to. Right. Because that income actually supplements the income you already have. So in the in the long run, that is the that is the prudent strategy to follow. And we can use that income towards getting a mortgage as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That that mortgage is is cash flow, right? So right. you need a good accountant to sort that all out for you. But it's actually cash flow, and not only that, but as the, the property appreciates, you can also refinance the equity from the property and use that money to buy other properties. And that's what they call the B R R R R. I don't know if you're you're familiar with that. That's no. so you buy, you renovate, you rent, and then you re- refinance, and then you rinse and repeat. Okay. I didn't well, make so, that up. So for- it's not, I wish I made that up, but you know this is all over the internet right now. That's cool. So that's, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what you so, want to so do. So again, it was buy, yeah. refinance. No, 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 not yet. Buy. Okay. And then you want to uh, renovate. Buy, renovate. Okay. Yeah, and rent it out. Right. And then you refinance it. Right. And then you rinse and repeat. Yeah. Makes sense. We are the blur. Right. Exactly. Great. So, cool. Awesome. OK. Yeah. So uh, I know we were talking earlier and um, so I, I know you're really big into cash flow properties and, and it makes sense why you're saying that, because then you can you can grow the flywheel faster. Right. Makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think it's also probably sure. better yeah. from a risk perspective as well, right? Um, sure. And I know you're specifically into student housing. Do, do you want to tell us a yes. little bit about that yeah, and absolutely. how that works? Well, uh, that's that's the, the concept of student housing because uh, the ones I've, I've recently um, been involved with is in Waterloo. There are five bedroom uh, condos. So you have five incomes coming in on one particular condo unit, which gives you... Um, Multitudes, uh, um, a multi-stream of income, and also mitigates your risk because if one tenant leaves, you sell four other tenants, right? And these uh, condos actually give you a very, very healthy positive cash flow. In fact, some of my investors that invested twenty percent are making six, seven hundred dollars positive every single month. So, so what was uh, so how, on how big of an investment? Six, seven hundred dollars. Uh, the the uh, the investments about five hundred thousand, roughly. Right. And okay. on twenty percent. Down payment, okay. They're they're cash flowing, positive cash flowing, about five hundred dollars per month. Say five, okay. say five, you know, five fifty. Okay, like so a hundred thousand dollar investment, five fifty per month. You know, it's approximately six thousand dollars a year. So that's a pretty good cash flow, right? That's it's cash on cash. You know, 
As, yeah. Absolutely. So, so you could buy, if you could buy far, five of them, you would get about $3,000 per month, right? Cash flow, right. roughly. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah I, know, uh, <clears throat> I know a lot of people that actually, uh, they, they take the opposite view. They say, uh, buy a place downtown Toronto, and they say to buy that specifically because the market's going up in value yeah. and because it's, they live close by. What, what would you uh, say to those people? Well, here it is, okay? Like I said to you, you have to know why you, what your exit strategy is. Why are you buying it? Okay, if you're buying it to flip and sell, downtown is fabulous for that, okay? Because downtown has, has a fantastic appreciation. So it's the turtles, sorry, the turtle and the hare story, right? So the people buying downtown is the hare. They want fast. You know, they're going to go in there, you know, fix the kitchen, fix the bathrooms, do the hardwood floors, flip it and make themselves a healthy profit, right? That's the hair story, right? People buying, uh, say, these condos in Waterloo and getting a five, $600 cash flow, they're the turtles, right? Because right. in the long run, they're not really looking at the appreciation of the property. They're looking at the cash flow appreciation because every year uh, your rents are allowed to go up at least 2%, right? right? So in the long run, your cash flow is going to increase. Your mortgage is going to be paid down, so your interest on your mortgage is going to be less, so in the long run, you're going to have more and more cash flow, net cash flow, positive cash yeah. flow. So that's the that's the that's the turtle growing a tree as opposed to you know <laughs> eating all the seeds right now because you know because because you you know you enjoy eating. Yeah, I've been I, I've done both. I've done both. You know, and uh, when I first started, I was the hare. I was buying properties downtown because I didn't have a lot of money. Right. So uh, one of the properties I flip uh, was at Bathurst Harbor. I bought it for one hundred fifty nine thousand. This was quite a while ago. And uh, I flipped it for two hundred eighty four, eighty four, two hundred eighty four thousand in four months. I made myself a healthy profit. Right. It was great. Life was good. Right. Mm -hmm. But had I held on to that same property that was one fifty nine, it just sold in twenty nineteen last year. I, I guess last year now is was still in January. But last year it sold for two point two million dollars. Right. right. So nice. the turtle yeah. would have enjoyed the two point two million. But the hair, I enjoyed the hundred thousand uh, dollars, you know, uh, gain immediately. Right. So yeah, it, it's, it's your strategy. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Right. You need money now, then buy, buy, fix and flip. If you need money later on, you just want to invest it. Right. Like people would invest in RSPs. Right. They don't see that money until they're sixty five or or older. Right. right. So for those people that want to kind of like turtle their investment then buying with cash flow is the way to go. Right. So so you're saying that the one option is buy, fix, and flip. Uh, what would you say to people that are buying in? And th there's going to be people listening to this from all around the world. So, uh, you know, any large city, I think, it really applies. Um, you know, buying in a large city where you're not necessarily making cash flow and you're also not renovating, right? Would you recommend that type of investment where you do not renovate the apartment? You're simply well, buying... You're not getting cash flow, but you want something close by that you live close by, um, so you can maintain it. What, what would you say to those those type of people? I would say you have to watch the cash flow. If you got a lot of money, no problem. <clears throat> but if you're using some of your income from other sources to pay for the negative cash flow, then I think that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it depends what you want to do. I mean, you know, if if you're not flipping downtown Toronto, you're really looking for the appreciation. You're looking for that million dollar property to go up to two million dollars, and then you can enjoy a million dollars profit one day, right? Not not a bad strategy, but you should try and combine that with cash flow as well, right? Yeah. Which is difficult to do downtown Toronto, but try and find maybe more than one tenant. Okay, it's very dangerous to buy property one tenant. You only have one source of income from that property. If you buy with more than one tenant, say two, three, or four, now you mitigate your risk, and also you have a better chance of getting a positive cash flow. Yeah, that's that's really important. Yeah, but as far as downtown, yeah, as far as downtown Toronto is concerned, if you're looking for appreciation, to be honest with you, downtown Toronto is not even the best appreciation there is right now. Really, and I have a, I have a chart uh, which was done by Remax that pre uh, predicts the. Uh, the uh, appreciation um, percentage of all the cities in Ontario. And some okay. of the cities that are doing fantastic, it's like Windsor. Windsor's doing great, you know. Uh, Ottawa's doing good too, right? And uh, Niagara Region's doing great. So there's a lot of uh, cities that actually outdo Toronto. 
But you have to remember, Toronto, because it's such a high price compared to Windsor, your return, let's say, you know, let's say a million dollars, 5% of a million dollars is a lot more than 5% on $300,000 house in Windsor, right? So right. you have to we can still buy three of those properties, though, right? Exactly. So if you if you were to do that, <laughs> like if you were to buy three, three of the properties in Windsor, you actually will you'll actually do better from the appreciation point of view in this, right. you know, in, in 2020, right? So you have to really look at and analyze everything. It's not, it's not just one size that fits all. There are so many things to, 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 to factor into it and to, you know, to determine what's a good investment. And like I said, you, you, you sort of have to know up front what you want to do. Do you want to sell it or do you want to hold on to it? Right. So, so I think that's a great, great topic to follow. So I think uh, there's always that, that old adage that location, 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 right? right? Uh, that's number one thing in, in real estate. Sure. So um, you mentioned a couple of spots around uh, Southern Ontario. Um, for viewers that are listening uh, somewhere in the U.S. or in other parts of the world, how do you think they should approach what location they should purchase in? How can they find this information to figure out where they should be buying? Well, for me, obviously, but, you know, if, uh, if they want to Google the information, then <laughs> if they want to Google the information, then look for population growth. OK, uh, look for jobs. You know, is there a lot of jobs in the in the area? Look for the economic economy. Look at and see what the, the government is promoting. For instance, uh, when you see a gold trade going to Niagara Falls, OK, you know the government is supporting Niagara Falls as one of the upcom upcoming cities. When you see uh, Trudeau going to Waterloo and, and investing money in Waterloo to uh, to uh, uh, improve the uh, infrastructure, you know, they want to make that a better place and more more. Right. In a more uh, popular place for people to go. So you look for signs like that, you know, uh, fundamentals, I guess, fundamentals. Right. You look for appreciations in different areas. and But more importantly, you look at the the property itself. And like I said, if you if you find a cell, you should be looking for a neighborhood that has people that want to live in it. It's more right. important than... You know, if, if, you're gonna, if, you, if you're looking to sell it to an investor, then you better make those numbers great make those tenant income great and expenses great. That's what it, that's what appeals to investors. They're all about numbers. But if you're looking to buy a home, say in Rosedale for $5 million and flip it for $8 million, you're in the right spot. That's because people would pay $8 million for a bridal path, Rosedale, Forest Hill, and, and that type of thing. So it, 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 you know, if, if you're looking to buy and sell, I would say for the appreciation, look for neighborhoods that people really want to live in. Right. Okay. Whereas if you're looking to, yeah, whereas you're looking to invest for cash flow for the, like the turtle, the turtle concept, okay, then you want to find locations where there's plenty of tenants, a lot of tenants, and you're gonna, you, you know, there's high demand, there's low vacancy and high demand for for rentals. That's where you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, take advantage of of the uh, rental income that's available to you, and you don't have to worry about losing your cash flow because the GM plant decided to close up right so th right. those those little things you, you want you want to you want to uh, keep in keep in the back of your mind when you're looking at a neighborhood to, to to invest in okay so population growth lots of jobs or i guess growth in jobs as well and then yes. low vacancy rates so it's basically a high demand for these properties yeah <clears throat> that that is you're looking to buy the whole right if you buy yeah. and sell then you want to you want to look for neighborhoods where people want to live in right there are some areas in Toronto where people don't want to live in. I, I, I don't want to single out, but obviously as a realtor, yeah. uh, Jane and Finch was one of those neighborhoods that was very difficult to sell. So if you want to buy and flip a house, Jane and Finch probably wasn't a good place at that time. Although right. a lot has changed since then, right? But just, just to give you an example, right? So you want to get into neighborhoods that, are, that, that people want to live in, you know? Yeah. If that yeah, makes sense. That makes sense. You know? That's great. So what would you say to people? And I know we had a discussion around this before. So now we're opening up uh, a lot more space for us to be investing in, right? So let's say I live in one part of the world and uh, now we're talking about, uh, for context, for anyone else who's listening to this, sure, uh, sure. we're talking about something like 50 miles away, right? right. This is obviously going to be difficult for me to manage personally, yeah, right? Totally. So what is your recommendation around property managers? Because I know we spoke about this before, and it was it was sure. a great discussion. I'd love to right. yeah. hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I always advocate that if you're going to invest in uh, real estate, you should treat it as a business, okay? You're not going to, like I, I, I referenced Starbucks, right? You're not going to open a Starbucks and serve coffee by yourself. You're going to have to hire some employees, right? And that's no different than investing in real estate. You really should have your team, your 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 dream team, right? And one of the key members in the dream team is, uh, is a property manager. So you have to have some good property managers. How you can find them, you can find them through me, some other realtors, from other investors investors, you can Google it, you know, there's so many ways to finding a good uh, uh, good property manager, but you really need a good property manager because you don't want, you know what, I, I'll, I'll be frank with you, when I, when I had so many properties at one time and I had to manage them myself, it was it was a nightmare, I, I got sick of it, I, I didn't even enjoy it anymore. Until I got property managers to look after my property, then I can walk away and say, hey, this is great, right, you know, I don't want to rent Starbucks by myself, you know. Yeah. I want, and, and I guess yeah. if we have that cash flow, then we don't have to worry so much, right? Absolutely, absolutely. That's yeah. that's the key, right? That's yeah. the key. But it's like opening a Starbucks, right? You, you know, if you don't sell coffee, you're not going to do. You're not going to be very happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're, if you're not <laughs> so making a profit for employees, exactly. that's going to be very difficult to hire yeah. those employees. Totally, right? totally. You have to yeah. make enough to pay the employees, pay the lease, the rent, and pay everything else, and still have some money left over for yourself. Then yeah. life is good, right? Yeah. Then then it's and a lot easier. You could. Then you can open up where you're buying, right? You don't have to just buy where you live. You can buy further yeah. away because right. you have the cash flow from the property, because you can hire the property manager. Right. It makes your life a lot easier and you're getting cash in, inflowing, right? right. That, that sounds like a great investment to me. Yeah, yeah I, I found a location. A lot of people think location, location, location. It's true, but they think location is, is, a, is a geographical uh, location, right? I prefer to look at location as a demographical location <laughs> because people are your customers. The people that buy your flip are people, right? The people that rent from you are people. So I'd rather look at the dem demographic uh, type of locations to buy. I think that's, it's kind of like opening um, a, a bacon and eggs restaurant in a kosher area, right? <laughs> You're not gonna sell too much bacon in a kosher well. area. Yeah. Right? I, I wouldn't do that, right? So, yeah. so you know, you know, just be, just because you say, oh wow, I love Mississauga. I want to open in Mississauga. Oh, you like, or oh, you like bathrooms? You know, I don't know where the kosher people would hang up, but I think bathrooms is one of them. But uh, you don't want to open some place where you serve pork, right? Right. It doesn't doesn't work. So I, I hope I'm not too extreme. I hope your listeners forgive me for like comparison. <laughs> you know, the point is that you want to open a location for the demographics of that of that location. Yeah. 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 That, that makes yeah, a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, the way that I'm interpreting that is, is basically we want to look at the micro locations as well, right? So it's not just about the Absolutely. city. It's about the, the specific neighborhoods within the city, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So I know, I know one type of neighborhood that you really like is, is the student housing. So, which basically means, I guess, next to a university or a college, right? Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the investments you're doing there? I know we briefly covered it before. But I remember uh, when we've spoken in the past, uh, these are like just fantastic numbers. Um, do, yes. do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, student housing is, uh, well, for one, uh, the, the the hubs is uh, Waterloo. There's what, London, Kingston's doing well. Ottawa's doing well. There's uh, there's Brock University down, down in uh, Thoreau. All these uh, uh, universities are doing extremely well. I kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Waterloo and, and London. Uh, simply because I've done a lot of work there, uh, and and the, the 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 beauty of it is that there's such a high demand. I mean, I went out to Waterloo around September the second or third, and there was so the students like line up down, you know, like just like they were giving away free turkeys or something. It was, it was, just, you know, it was just crazy lining up, you know, yeah, for, for free uh, turkey would have been great for in a place uh, of rent, right? College, yeah. So they um, in the last ten or twelve years they haven't had any vacancy. I mean, they have to report like. Two percent or something, but it really is is zero percent vacancy. Mm -hmm. Wow! So you're That's saying that we get, get you're saying that we get zero uh, percent. Uh, that you're seeing zero percent vacancy rates. Is that something that you're seeing across the board for all universities and colleges, or is this just specific ones that are having? Because zero percent vacancy is, is amazing. Right? Sure. Sure. Yeah, uh, Robert, because I focus so much on Waterloo, I can only comment about Waterloo and London right now. I mean, there are some that's uh, up and coming in Ottawa and Kingston and some down in Thoreau, but I haven't really done enough research into those ones at this point in time. But mm -hmm. definitely uh, London and Waterloo is, is 
very high demand for student housing. And the beauty of the student housing is that number one, it's like a legal rooming house if you want to if you want to look at it from that point of view. It's uh, well managed. It's, there's property managements that look after the entire building, and there's also uh, a condo fee that looks after the maintenance of the building. And they have security guard like you know in in uh, in Waterloo they have 24 hour security. Uh, you know these kids. They go there to, to to study. They're not there to cause trouble. They're, you know, the worst thing that they want is the phone call to the parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if they if they put a hole in the wall and say, you know what, I'm gonna have to call your parents, and before you know it, they fixed it. Okay, so yeah. so they actually pretty good tenants. Okay, it's interesting. Um, I guess it's a little different from uh, my my college days. Some of my roommates weren't the greatest. <laughs> Um, but but I can understand that you know building with security yeah. and things like that. That's probably a very different kind of building, right? And, yes. and again, like to, to your point, that the micro locations, the little neighborhoods, right? right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's what's good about student housing is you're getting more than one income on the unit. It's very difficult to do. I although I have people like even in Mississauga, they rent one bedroom and they rent a room to a, a roommate. You know, just to you know, but. To do it legally, uh, you want to get into student housing, student condos. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So you can legally have, you know, four, five, six. I actually live in a house back in college with 10 people in it. Well, there uh, you go. Is, yeah. It's yeah. a beautiful house, too. It's like a giant, yeah. like, mansion that they yeah. turned into a student house. It's fantastic, yeah. actually. Um, if my, my old landlord's listening, she's actually a fantastic landlord. I'll tell you how much. <laughs> and she... And and to your point, actually, she she was actually very wealthy. I remember okay. meeting my landlord back in the day, and I think she owned four of these properties. It wasn't even that many, but like right. her own house was this giant mansion. I, I yeah. swear to you, probably six seven thousand square feet in a really nice neighborhood. I remember going there once to drop off a check, and I was just like, "Geez, yeah. like how do, how do I get to this point?" Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's great. She definitely did something right, and, and it sounds like this is yeah. probably one of the reasons why, right? Yeah, and she and she and she subscribes to the turtle strategy, right? Buy it, get cash flow, hold on to it, right? And buy another right. one, hold on to it. Yeah. Right. So we we talked about the numbers before, where you're looking at something like a hundred thousand dollar investment will net you something like five thousand dollars a month in cash flow. I think that's great. Um, uh, what about the appreciation in the property? What kind of what kind of numbers have you been seeing altogether uh, in terms of investment returns for these types of properties? Well, uh, in L- London was gang ba- um Sorry, let me say that again. London yeah. was gangbusters. Okay, gangbusters. Uh, yeah. Gangbusters. Yeah, they were. They they were. They were like around ten point seven percent appreciation last year. It was like crazy. Wow. They, they, yeah, they're the highest. They were. They were the highest appreciating city in in uh, Ontario at, at wow. one time. So uh, I just use like three percent appreciation, you know, which is very, uh, uh, you know, which is very uh, doable mm-hmm. in most cities, you know. So it depends what you're looking for. I I, I wouldn't look at buying a student uh, condo to flip. I'll be honest with you. It's not it's not the flipping kind of, but it's it's a cash cow. It's a cash flowing cow that you want to hold right. on to, and just keep it for you know forever, you know, and give it to your kids when you you know when you're done with it. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm trying to run the numbers here. That, that I mean, a 10% appreciation in a property, if you're leveraged, right, you're yeah. only putting 10% down, that, the, the appreciation alone is getting you something like 80% or whatever. Okay. And then on top of that, you have the cash flow coming in and it's paying off your mortgage. It, yeah. it seems like very low risk, a very high return type of investment. Oh, that's awesome. It's, a, yeah. it's amazing. People, people don't realize how amazing uh, real estate investing is. And also, you haven't talked about the taxes as well. You can also, if you're working at a job, you don't have any means of writing anything off. But once you own investment property, guess what? You're entitled to write-offs. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all yeah. The, all the, you know, the trips, gas, things like that, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. Well, when you write off all, all the expenses of the, of the property, right? You know, property taxes, mortgage interest, uh, insurance, uh, you know, management, maintenance, you know, every anything that that is associated with you uh, earning that income can be written off. Yeah, definitely, that's great. You're you're really making me want to buy some student housing. Maybe after this, we should talk about <laughs> actually getting well, a property. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the, the other, the other uh, uh, you know, not everybody's in the student housing, and there's some people that want to buy regular houses, you know, um, on the ground houses. And yeah. uh, the strategy there is to, I find one of the better strategies right now is to buy a single family home with a separate side entrance and a basement potential apartment. Either you renovate it and fix it up or you just, you, just, uh, you know, upgrade it a little bit and get it legalized. Once you have it legalized, you have basically a duplex, a residential duplex that's not that doesn't fall into the commercial pricing or the commercial mortgage financing. And I find it to be uh, a very, very lucrative way of investing in properties right now. Yeah, so you're basically saying buy a house that does not, that already has a finished basement or that you can turn into a finished basement. What do you think is the better, or does it turn, not matter? Turn, turn into, I, I would say turn into a legal, legal basement apartment. I like them uh, somewhat, somewhat finished because it saves me in renovation costs, right? And uh, also, even if you buy uh, a property that's lower in price because the basement's not finished, right? By the time you spend the money to finish it, you're spending that money out of your pocket, not in the mortgage. Does it make sense? Let's say yeah. you, let's, let's say the same house is six hundred thousand for unfinished basement, and you spend fifty thousand to finish the basement. That fifty thousand is out of your pocket. Where right. if you buy yeah, the it's not same house six fifty with the finished basement, right? Now it's in the mortgage. Now eighty percent of that renovation is already covered in the mortgage. That yeah. yeah. So right. I, I know that it's possible to, to get a mortgage on that renovation, but I know it's, it's, there are some differences there, right? It's a little harder right. to get that kind of a loan. It's more and also there's, there's time, time value as well, right? Because yeah. if you can get in there and rent it out right away, you got cash flow right away, right? If you, yeah. can, if you go in there and have to renovate for three months or four months, you don't have cash flow for three, four months. So you have to look at everything and, and see how it fits into your strategy. You know, it's it's not as simple as people think, but it's not as difficult as people think either, right? You just have to get educated, understand how things work, and be able to manipulate it so to, to make it work in your advantage. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's great. Yeah. So cash flowing properties, student housing, I think that sounds like probably the winner here. It's sexy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's really sexy. Definitely. I mean, to me, uh, that that definitely feels sexy. Making making an eighty percent a year return that's uh, that's definitely something that would that get me up in the morning. I, right? I have to be honest. I have I have investors calling me all the time. You have a, you have an, another one available. You have another one available, right? And they go pretty fast. To be honest with you, so yeah. I got a few right now. So I'm working on them. Yeah, that's great. So if someone wants to get in contact with you, uh, if if they do live in the South Ontario area. Or even if they live somewhere else and maybe they want to yeah. buy a property here, get a property manager as well, so they don't even have to be that close by, uh, how would they uh, get in touch with you? Well, uh, my name, Tony Ning at dot com, www.tonyning, that's T O N Y N I N G, N like Niagara, and dot com. That's okay. how they can get so a hold of me. And, uh, yeah, or they can get a hold of you and you can get a hold of me. That, that, yeah, that, that can work I mean, too. Leave yeah. comments here. Yeah. I, I think it's but, probably best for them to go to your website directly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming they can find uh, your yeah. email address and all that as well, right? Yeah, just just to add a little bit of something, I do have an associate that uh, works in the U.S. Right now, he's developing a lot of properties in the Florida region. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so so if someone comes to me and says, I want to buy in the U.S., I can, I can refer them to my associate that does a lot of uh, same concept, you know, positive cash flowing properties in the U.S. Right. Yeah. So, so really, I think that's important too, is, uh, you know, I've spoken to other real estate agents before and, you know, every real estate agent wants to help you find a property, but, but I think it's important to find one uh, like yourself who actually understands how to buy investment properties, Absolutely. right? Because it's one thing to buy a home to live in. It's a whole different story to find something that's going to actually make you money. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's like if you need uh, heart surgery, you don't want someone that's an ear, nose and throat specialist, right? So, right. You need right, a heart exactly. specialist. Yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and that's, that's very helpful. Yeah, so this, is, this has been a great conversation. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you want to leave the audience with before we, uh, before we part ways? I would say if you're serious about uh, investing in real estate, it's, you know, it's fantastic. It's been great for me. It's, uh, I have to say any money that I have came from real estate. I, yeah. I didn't make it in any, I, I've done other things in my life, but you know, it's real estate that, that really uh, paid off. And uh, the, the first step is to get educated, get, you know, understand, you know, don't just take people's word for it, learn it so that you understand what's involved, right? 
Yeah. And uh, I'm working. I'm offering some workshops uh, for people that want to learn, and that will be talked about later on. You know, they can reach out to me personally for that if they want okay. to. So, yeah. so again, the, the TonyNing.com. Send you an email. They could get these workshops, or they could help get help finding a property as well, right? Absolutely. Actually, actually, I I I have a program that I call them Happy Deals. You know, McDonald's got Happy Meals. I got okay. happy meals, right? So you go to McDonald's, you get a combo. You don't have to think about it. What you know, whatever combo that you want, right? So I actually uh, have a team here that analyzes the properties, packages them together, and we present them to the investors for their consideration. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it saves them a lot of a lot of work and a lot of uh, you know, uh, trying to a lot of time trying to analyze what's good and what's bad. Yeah, that makes sense. I like that. Ha- happy deals. Happy deals, yeah. <laughs> when awesome. you come to my window, just order happy deals. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, well, thank you very much, Tony, for being on the show. Um, I look forward to speaking with you in the future. And uh, actually, yeah. for, for anyone who's going to be listening, you're going to be speaking in person on February 6th at uh, the Lumi Wealth sponsored event um, in Toronto. So if anyone's in Toronto, they can see you in person, speak to you in person as well. Okay. I'm looking forward to it, and thank you very much, Robert. You've been great. I'm yeah. really happy to get to know you. Awesome. Likewise. Thank you very much for being on the show. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Okay. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the conversation, don't forget to subscribe. We're going to be having these once a week, so this will be a way for you to stay up to date with all the latest things that come out. And if you have any questions about what we talked about or if you have any people that you want to bring on the show or any topics that you want to cover, Don't forget to leave comments. I'll get back to you guys as soon as I possibly can, and we're going to keep improving this thing over time. So again, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to leave the comments. And let's figure out some ways that we can illuminate the path to your wealth. Thank you.